My name is Abdurrahman Malik. I'm canvassing the world for the most interesting people to hear about their journeys, their work, and what it means to be alive in the world today. And perhaps nobody has captured that experience of being alive better than the 13th century Persian poet and Sufi mystic Jalaluddin Rumi in his poem, The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. So welcome to This Being Human, a podcast inspired by Rumi's words and motivated by all those who carry that message forward in the world today. Today, award-winning author and public intellectual, Hamid Dabashi. I always say this sinking boat in the middle of the Mediterranean with people desperate to get to a safe shore, that's the sight of being a Muslim. What do you do on that boat? What is your responsibility? What is your moral obligation? And in one sense, the whole earth is that sinking boat in the Mediterranean that needs care. What does it mean to be Muslim in the world? It's a big question, one that I think about a lot and one that Hamid Dabashi uses as the title and central question of one of his books. As the Hagop Kevorkian Professor of Iranian Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, Dabashi has made a career out of scholarship, critique, and commentary. He has over 20 books to his name on everything from the Green Revolution in Iran to Palestinian film, to the role of travel in Islam. And while he's known for his contributions to academia and criticism, he's led a long and fascinating life, and we'll get into it, from his involvement in a Hollywood blockbuster, to his friendship with renowned critic Edward Said, to how he almost burnt down his house as a child trying to build his own movie theater. Professor Hamid Dabashi, it's a pleasure to have you on This Being Human. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Abdurrahman. Hamid, when we reached out to you, you responded by sending us The Guest House by Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi in its original Farsi, which was delightful because the poem, of course, means so much to us as part of this program. I want to start off by asking, what does the poem mean to you? You know, Rumi, as uh, we always say, is like a river, is like a sea, is like a torrent, is always running, is always there. You may not know it, you may not pay attention to it, but it's always there. And it is absolutely astonishing how I've been with his Masnavi since my early childhood. You know, when the wandering dervishes will come to our neighborhood and sing for uh, from Masnavi, Bishnu as chun hikau yat mi kona. You know, from there. And I was fascinated by this wandering dervish uh, who had one of these kashkuls in his hand uh, full of uh, nogl, this sweet uh, stuff. I was just both mesmerized by him and frightened by him. And to this day, it, the same is with Rumi. I'm, I'm in love with him. I'm mesmerized by him. The poem that you mentioned is a poem that is really for a time of trouble, when troubling things are coming to you, personal, professional, whatever, and you feel desperate. You feel, what the hell is this? And Rumi is telling you, listen, your body, your soul, your existence is like a guest house. And all of these events that happen to you, they come enter into this guest house and spend some time with you. And then they leave. <laughs> so don't be too preoccupied. Oh my God, how am I going to go with this? You know, my job is this, or my marriage is that, or my children is this. R- right now, I'm, I'm petrified because my young, we are getting my younger daughter into a public school and we didn't get the school that she likes. So, you know, I'm all over the place fighting with vast, cruel 
bureaucracy of uh, Department of Education. So then I read Rumi and I say, okay, it will, it will be sorted out. It will be fine. It will be sorted out. This is what he's telling you. And at one point she says, yeah, you look at some guests and say, oh my God, when is he going to leave? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, eventually they will leave and other guests will come. I love it. So it was bizarre. It was uh, prophetic. I was just reading that poem that I received your email. So, oh, uh, let me send them the original. (laughs) I'm so pleased you did. Where does this incredible love for literature and books and language come from? Again, you have to seek it in your childhood And the storytelling. My mother was a magnificent storyteller. And so was my maternal grandmother, Bibi Marvali, we called her. When for the first time in my 30s, I saw a mother in Philadelphia when I had just moved to U.S., uh, putting her child on her lap and putting a book in front of them and reading from the book. I I said, this is weird. Why is she reading the story? She has to tell the story. And this is how the love of poetry and literature emerges. I vividly remember as a child, five, six-year-old, my grandmother in my uncle's uh, rooftop telling us the stories when it's dark and she had a beautiful voice or to our ear appeared beautiful and full of intonations. And then the other thing, Abdurrahman, is the oral tradition of poetry. My mother knew, you tell me how, Lines and lines of poetry of Hayyam from heart, much of it in dialogue with God. Mm. That, oh yes, she would tell us, one day Hayyam was sitting by this magnificent river in a beautiful garden and having his cup of wine and, and such and having a ball. And then suddenly a wind comes and his cup is overthrown. So he turns to God. This is my mother telling me. He's a very pious woman. He's a very pious Muslim. <laughs> and he says, addresses God and says, uh, shikasti rabbi. I mean, I can hear her talk. Oh God, you broke my cup. Bar man bibasti rabbi. Oh God, you disallowed me my fun. Man tumi kuni badmasti. I drink, you get drunk. God gets very angry and punishes uh, Khayyam, and Khayyam looks into the river and sees half of his face is white and half of his face is black, so he's flabbergasted. So he turns to God and says, you know, I did wrong. Man bad kunamu, tu bad mukafaat dahi, pas farqe miyane man tu chiz begu. I did wrong, and you punished me wrongly. So what's the difference between you and me? Where does people learn this poetry? That's incredible. She learned from her mother. Where did she get it? Where was her mother? I mean, this magnificent ocean of oral stories that circulates. And then the other part, which is the public space, is the stories that these naqals, storytellers, the wandering naqals, were telling in front of a canvas that's the beginning of cinema. You say, uh, about cinema? You know, there used to be this canvas full of magnificent paintings. Stories from Shahnameh, stories from Karbala, stories from Amir Hamza, all sorts of stories. And they were great orators. And they knew where to stop as a, at a cliffhanger. Uh, at the, they would stop at the cliffhanger and then collect some money and then tell the story. They were master storytellers. They changed their story depending on what audience they had. If they had young people, they would tell love stories. If they had old people, they had stories about the hell and heaven and to good dude. <laughs> they had a huge repertoire. They had a huge, much more important than the Metropolitan Opera House. Hamid left Iran in his early adult life to pursue a PhD in the United States. He ended up settling in New York, where he now lives. Hamid's adopted home in the United States has had a tense relationship with Iran. And Hamid has been critical both of the government of his home country and of issues of justice and colonization in the United States. So I wondered, has that tension driven his work? Probably, Adar Rahman, probably. But there is another aspect of it, which is the fact 
that I am the father of four American children who don't have any other country, don't know any country. I mean, and by virtue of being the father of four American kids, I can't be a foreigner in this country. I'm not an American. I consider myself an Iranian who lives in New York. That's all there is to it. There's no metaphysical uh, anything. But here in New York, particularly in New York, but in U.S. in general, I have two lineage to which I place myself. Yes, I am self-consciously and confidently an Iranian, a Shia, and a Muslim. Ishaq recently wrote to me from South Africa, Hamid, I included this in my writing, and somebody said, Hamid is not even Muslim. I said, are you insane? <laughs> what, do you, what, what is that supposed to mean? I, my mother gave me my, uh, my, my faith. You, your friends want to take it away from me? Of course I'm a Muslim. The lineage of that, the two lineage, one is Jewish intellectual immigration in the aftermath of the Nazi horror in Europe, and they came to United States. That's one genealogy with which Hannah Arendt, Adorno, uh, etc. I deeply identify. And the other is with Harlem Renaissance, with, uh, with the generation of African-American intellectuals of James Baldwin and W. D. Du Bois and Malcolm X and, and so forth. I live in the shadow of uh, Magnificent Malcolm. So in between these two genealogies of Jewish intellectual immigration and Harlem Renaissance, I place myself. You know, Edward Said, Allah yarham hu, may he rest in peace, wrote an essay towards the end of his life that he was the last Jewish intellectual. And I recently, in my book on Edward, a collection of my work on Edward, I said that if Edward Said was the last Jewish intellectual, I'm the first Muslim intellectual. Uh, Hamid, you, you, you speak about Edward Said, the Palestinian-American scholar who coined arguably one of the most important terms of our era, Orientalism. But as you said, you you connected, of course, to his intellectual legacy and his work, but you were his friend. And I'm interested in hearing from you about that friendship. Do you remember your first meeting with Edward Said? Of course I do. Uh, first of all, something that I have also recently said, I was drawn to Edward Said because of Palestine. I was not drawn to Palestine because of Edward Said. When I came to Colombia in late 1980s, of course, I knew Edward work. I had read Orientalism in graduate school, and I also knew his, his writing on Palestine and uh, literary criticism and all of that. But for months, maybe a year, maybe more, I would not dare to go near him. I was so shy, I was so bashful, I was so shivering, and uh, go the other side of the campus and all of that. And then finally, my theology of discontent was out and I collected my courage and I autographed a copy and then I sent it to Zainab Astarabadi, Allah Hirhamha, she just passed away. And he gave it to Edward. And Edward wrote me a beautiful, long handwritten letter on his Columbia stationery, thanking me, praising the book and all of that. I still have the letter. And then I collected my courage and, you know, called him and made an appointment and went and see him. And uh, yes, that was the beginning of our friendship. I was putting together a, a film course in which I was going to include Palestinian films. He put me in touch with Palestinian filmmakers and that that's be began a whole different journey as we went on. And that became a solid foundation of friendship, solidarity, uh, camaraderie, collegiality, collaboration on various projects that, you know, was cut short, very brutally cut short after his passing. Amid, uh, you know, you knew Edward Said, but for all those of us who loved his work and in some ways are his children, are his intellectual children, we mourned and the world mourned, not just an academic and an intellectual, but but an artist, uh, a, a man of letters who exuded a kind of an incredible elegance and beauty, really. What has his absence meant for you over these years? Uh, let me tell you the most uh, poignant event. When Edward passed away, Allah yarhamha, may he uh, rest in peace. 
There was a question, where should he be buried? Some people wanted him to be buried in Jerusalem, but his wife wanted him to be buried in Beirut, near her family, which is where he ended up. So what I did when I went to Palestine, I went to Palestine to take our Palestinian Film Festival to five Palestinian cities and went to one of the cemeteries. There's a cemetery of the Prophet Sahaba right near Babul Usud in uh, near Haram al-Sharif. And I took a fistful of dust from the cemetery of, uh, of the Sahaba, put it inside a bag, plastic bag, put it in my pocket and came back to New York. We had a memorial for Edward. And then after that, I flew to Beirut because now I was taking my Palestinian Film Festival to Palestinian refugee camps. On that occasion, I went to Edward's uh, uh, grave. It's a beautiful black stone under an olive tree. It looks like a bonsai. And I placed the soil that I had brought from Jerusalem on his grave. And I said to myself, if Muhammad can't go to the, to the mountain, mountain comes to, the, to Muhammad. It's a beautiful scene of mountains of uh, Lebanon. And yeah, I mean, in a way, it was a homage I paid both bringing Jerusalem to Edward, as it were, and also homage as a Muslim, because I made sure that it comes from, you know, Edward was a Christian. But he was a magnificent defender of the Muslim dignity in his beautiful book, uh, Covering Islam, and on other occasions. So it was also a homage of a Muslim in gratitude to what Edward had done in protecting the dignity of the name of uh, of a Muslim. Hello, I am Dr. Ulrika Al-Khamis, the Aga Khan Museum's Interim Director and CEO. We hope you are enjoying this episode of This Being Human. If you like what you hear, please support us by rating This Being Human on your podcast app or by leaving a review. By sharing your feedback, you will help us grow our audiences and reach more people with the podcast's extraordinary human stories wonderfully told. Thank you so much. And now back to This Being Human. In addition to his love of reading, writing, and travel, Hamid has also had a lifelong love of cinema, and over the years he has built a name for himself in the film world. He has served on film festival juries, curated his own film festivals, and even become a highly sought-after consultant on Hollywood movies. His deep connection with movies begins with some of his earliest memories. We used to sleep on the roof. Many people in my part of the world, they do that. And they used to, there were these open air theaters that they would show Indian musicals, Narges, Vijintimala, and Raj Kapoor, and Shichi Kapoor, and all of that. And uh, uh, mothers will go to the roof to, you know, prepare the bed for us to sleep. And then they will sing, uh, hear the song and have a party uh, hearing Narges uh, sing. I can still remember it from my, uh, from my childhood. As he grew up, he came to love cinema so much that he tried to create his own DIY projector. My generation grew up with three musicals, Indian musicals, Egyptian musicals, and Hollywood musicals. These were, you know, the staple of our upbringing. And before you know it, I came to the idea I should invent a projector. Now, before I invented the projector, I invented a a slide projector, quote unquote, which consisted of a shoebox in which I had put a magnifier and uh, I would put a slide there and a magnifier and then go to the stairs that went to our roof and gave a mirror to my poor younger brother who stand behind the door reflecting with the mirror the sunlight through a hole into the shoebox, a hole in the shoebox 
that will go on the slides, go on a magnifier, and bra! <laughs> you had you had a beautiful picture of Steve Reeves as Hercules on a, you know small wall in the thing, for which I started selling tickets. You know, uh, you know, a penny to my friends. I made a business out of that. <laughs> uh, soon I <laughs> soon I thought I can expand on my invention and make a projector. So uh, the idea was to get a roll of these films. And uh, put a, uh, I said, now instead of poor, my poor brother reflecting the sun, I put a lamp. So I had a lamp connected to the uh, electricity. The lamp is there. The film is there and in, inside the shoebox and the uh, magnifier is there. So I said, if I move this film 33, 36, I forget, per second, this picture will start moving. So I have a movie. So I pulled this, I was with my cousin Jamshid, I pulled this to create, the, the simulate the, the projector. The film touched the hot lamp, got into fire. Jesus Christ, I almost burned the house down. <laughs> we were inside our living room. Fortunately, Jamshid was with me and vouched for me and my mother didn't kick and scream. She opened the door. She opened the door to scream at me. But as soon as she saw Jamshid, she said, oh dear, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I knew for a fact, if Jamshid was not there, that's it. I was done with. It starts there. Love of Indian cinema in particular. Long after Hamid's ill-fated attempt to create his own cinema, he got involved in Hollywood as a consultant on Ridley Scott's 2005 blockbuster, Kingdom of Heaven. It's an epic film about the Crusades, known particularly for its depiction of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, or Saladin, as he's called in the West. Saladin is more than just a historical figure. For many, he's an icon. He took back Jerusalem from the Crusaders, and stories of his mercy to the Christians and Jews of the Holy Land are often contrasted with the violence of the European knights. Hamid's involvement in the film all started with a surprise phone call. I was sitting in my office right here at Columbia, Kent Hall, telephone rings, I pick up the phone, and somebody on the other side uh, says, this is Ridley Scott. I said, excuse me? I thought somebody was joking with me. Then this is Ridley Scott. I said, Thelma and Louise Thelma and Scott? Alien Thelma and Scott? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Thelma and Louise Ridley Scott. So he said, I have, a, I have a script about the Crusades, and I wonder if you would uh, read it. I said, of course, happily, but do you want me to read it because of my work on cinema or because of my work on medieval Islam? I said, well, what do you think I called you? Both. So... Uh, Fox Studio, which was the production company, sent me this script by a magnificent scriptwriter, uh, William Moynihan, and I read it, and I made copious notes, uh, both structurally and also corrections of various sorts of uh, misunderstandings of medieval history, especially the battle scenes when they were happening. I wrote copious notes, sent them to Ridley Scott, And he loved them, and he invited me to go to uh, Pasadena to see after he was done with the first cut. So I went to Pasadena, spent a couple of weeks there with him, watching the the first cut, and made a few suggestions, some adjustments. Balian has a shipwreck and, you know, ends up in North Africa and said, well... He says, and they need a desert fight. I said, well, Jerusalem doesn't have any desert. What do you want? So, okay, somewhere in North Africa. I said, we can't have it in North Africa because the Fatimids are in Egypt. You you cannot go there. At any rate, it was fun and it worked. And then we sat and saw the final cut. And there was a wonderful press kit that I was part of it. And we remained in contact for a few years after that when he was thinking of various projects. It is a wonderful film, not just because of the figure of Salah comes out as, you know, magnificent as he is, but it came at a time that this fabrication of Jewish, Muslim, Christian hostility needed a historical reminder and he managed to do it beautifully.
In so many ways, you know, throughout our conversation, you have described moments from your life. And the impression that it leaves me with is that you are someone who is fully engaged in the world. You are in the world, being moved by the world. And in many ways, amongst your many magnificent works of, of scholarship, for me, your book, Being Muslim in the World, meant a great deal and came to me at a time in my life when I was asking the questions which you were asking, but wasn't necessarily finding the answers which you were providing or offering to us. And, you know, in this book, you examine this question very plainly and very clearly of what it means to be Muslim in the world. And there's a passage from that book, which I continue to revisit. I have to tell you, over the years, I've continued to revisit. And I, I would be honored, before I ask you about it, if you'd be willing to read it for us. With, with pleasure. Yes, this is from the book, To Be a Muslim in the World, in which I say, to be a Muslim in the world today, does not require an Islamic reformation, as some have suggested. Quite to the contrary, it requires the restoration of Islam back into its worldly disposition, remembering its conditions of pre-coloniality to deliver itself from the conditions of post-coloniality. If Osama bin Laden, Ayana Hirshi Ali, represent the two extremes of militant Islamism and virulent Islamophobia, respectively, reading Islam back and forth into a fictive past and a pathological present. The restoration of Islam into its worldly disposition means entrusting Muslims with the emerging and pressing task of being in the world. Islam has always been the dialogical outcome of Muslim collective consciousness, engaging in conversation with the dominant moral and intellectual forces in the world from a position of power. Having been for over two centuries at the receiving end of European and American imperialism and having turned their faith into a singular site of ideological resistance to those empires, Muslims will now have to retrieve that habitual dialogue, though not from a position of power, but from a position of care, care of the other, of the world, that will in turn redefine who and what they are. Thank you so much, Hamid. One of the things that struck me when I read this first, and I've read this again, and strikes me even as you've read it now, is this conclusion that you reach, that when all is said and done, politics, history, theology, global affairs, we set it all aside. To be Muslim in the world today is to offer care to those who are broken in a time of brokenness. I wonder, Hamid, how much these ideas resonate with you now? Listen, I am a product of that. I am the result of that. And that not only by virtue of my biological and biographical fact that I was born to a Muslim uh, mother and I was born to a Muslim context, but by virtue also of my lifetime dedication to study of Islam, history of Islam, ideologies of Islam. If 850 million human beings go to bed hungry every night, statistically, according to UN, if 350 million human beings roam around the globe in search of a decent uh, living, and we don't know how many of them are Muslims or non-Muslims, if I always say this sinking boat in the middle of the Mediterranean with people desperate to get to a safe shore. That's the site of being a Muslim. What do you do on that boat? What is your responsibility? What is your moral obligation? Not 
as a, any human being, I mean, Jews can ask this about being a Jew or Christian or uh, Hindu or whatever. But I, as a Muslim, ask, what does it mean if you are on that boat? What is your responsibility? And in one sense, the whole earth is that sinking boat in the Mediterranean that needs care. So we are in a position of rethinking Islam. Because Islam is really a manifestation of collective consciousness of Muslims. It's not anything that Muslims create what is Islam. Based on their heritage, their remembrances, their rituals, their doctrines. And in that context, what is your moral responsibility? In this context, that constitutes your being a Muslim in the world, period. Professor Hamid Dabashi, what does this being human mean to you? It's an ideal, it's an aspiration. We are mortal human beings. Rumi was this strange being that was sent to us by destiny, by, by humanity, by cosmos. We can only aspire to what he says. Rumi is already in paradise. He knows what is truth. And he is telling us the truth. I mean, he is the memory. Rumi is the memory of existence. Mm -hmm. Without that memory, we will be reduced to our daily routine banality. One more day more banal than the other. And suddenly there is a vision of Rumi that emerges and you see, uh aha. So that is the purpose. So that is the reason. Mm -hmm. Because he puts such a twist to reality that is outlandish, but it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. That's Rumi for you. Professor Hamid Dabashi, you cannot imagine what an honor and pleasure this conversation has been for me. Thank you so much for joining me on This Being Human. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for these magnificent questions and thank you for this delightful conversation. This Being Human is an Antica production. Our senior producer is Kevin Sexton. Our executive producer is Pasant Matar. Mixing and sound design by Phil Wilson. Our intern is Annie McLeod. Original music by Boombox Sound. Antica's executive producers are Kathleen Goldhar and Lisa Gabriel. Stuart Cox is the president of Antica Productions. This Being Human is generously supported by the Aga Khan Museum one of the world's leading institutions that explores the artistic, intellectual, and scientific heritage of Islamic civilizations around the world. For more information about the museum, go to www.agakhanmuseum.org. The museum wishes to thank Nader and Shabin Mohammed for their philanthropic support to develop and produce This Being Human.